at Temple University, uh, and I am, I am going to be your host today for our exciting webinar in Making Self-Directed Care a Reality. Uh, I have 2.30 Eastern Time, but would like to give a couple more minutes for some of our colleagues to join us, and uh, we should be getting started uh, uh, in just a couple of minutes. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to, uh, to our uh, webinar today entitled Making Self-Directed Care a Reality. Uh, background on this webinar is that uh, approximately a year ago, uh, Temple University, in partnership with the Mental Health Association of Southeastern Pennsylvania, and the Center for Mental Health Services Research and Policy at the University of Illinois at Chicago uh, received from the through their technology transfer initiative to develop manuals regarding the implementation of self-directed care in mental health systems um, that they've been that we've been involved with. The purpose of this webinar is to provide a little bit of background on the information that we've documented in our manuals. Uh, uh, and these manuals provide an in, in-depth, in detailed look at the policies, procedures, and practices that municipalities and states can use to promote uh, self-directed care. Um, the webinar will be, uh, presentations will be given by Dr. Judith Cook, who's professor and director of the Center on Mental Health Services Research and Policy in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Illinois. And Amy Malmola, who's the program manager of the CRIF Self-Directed Care Project in Delaware County here in Pennsylvania. And this is a program of the Mental Health Association of Southeastern Pennsylvania. Yeah. Kick off our webinar today, uh, we have a special guest, Joseph Rogers, who's Chief Advocacy Officer at the Mental Health Association of Southeastern Pennsylvania, who will be talking to us about the importance of self-directed care as a critical advance in promoting empowerment, self-determination, community integration, and 
addiction recovery of people who experience mental health issues. Joseph? Good afternoon. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Mark and Temple University and the collaborative and with uh, Cook uh, and partner I'm Ermi Malov for all the work they do and for putting on this uh, uh, on our, yes, uh, I, you know, 10 years ago, I met with the state uh, in, in Pennsylvania and made, met with the state office of mental health and other than the idea that we might do a self-directed care demonstration project in southeastern Pennsylvania. The, the thing that I had at the time was a long way in terms of trying to make our systems responsive to the individual. But we see sometimes it's not able to get right there. And who has a, a mouth that uh, changes and di diagnosis of bipolar disorder. I, I, I've experienced the mental health system recently, and I find myself many times struggling with the fact that it really looked at me as an individual. I treated even, even in private, uh, private care settings, private uh, pay care settings, I treat it as uh, the diagnosis, as a number, as as one of many, uh, not, not one of many, but just part of a whole. How do we get from treating people kind of cookie cutter fashion, where there's only a very limited choices? Even the best mental health systems in the country pretty much offer you a very menu of choices. We expand that menu. How can we make it so that people have real, real and that, that was what was think, I was thinking when I said our, uh, our mental health people who create a sick care where vigil is really in the driver's seat. Simple, but the concept of people being needs to direct their uh, make a huge difference. And so when I we demonstration project in the number seat and be able to actually have various choices and have resources. We call it freedom. Freedom work towards integration based on man. And to be your ability, and if you want to be happy, never recover, but still, it's your plan, and you develop it, and you really, your recovery plan. We talk about recovery plans, we wrap plans, and things like that, but fund those plans. You know, some side of the course of available. So our hope was our experiment, we've been able to put the more about it from uh, uh, in, in Texas, uh, 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 and you'll hear about it in Delaware with Erla. And I'm again here for me. Thank you. All right, you, Joseph. And uh, for those of you who are uh, uh, linked to Joseph, he, he's actually calling in on a cell phone. So the eruption was uh, in on a little bit. Uh, so uh, I'd like us to move on to our presentations from uh, Dr. Kirk, Dr. Cook and Ermi. Um, uh, thing I would like to say is these are two, uh, these are manuals that have been developed on some research that has been conducted uh, in partnership with Temple University and the Mental Health Association of Southeastern Pennsylvania with uh, the Delaware County, Pennsylvania Office of Mental Health well as uh, Mellon uh, um, and Judith Hook uh, will talk about the work that's done in Texas. The research was funded by the Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, and they're really manuals that have followed up upon that research uh, to disseminate the kinds of things that we've learned about how to 
uh, deliver and create effective programs out there. We'll have presentations in a second. One thing I would like to let people know is that during the course of this presentation or the presentations, you'll be able to submit questions that you'd like to be answered, either about what the, one of the presenters said or other questions related to the delivery of self-directed care. Please enter it in the chat feature of this uh, WebEx system. And what I will do is I will go through those questions and select some of them for discussion. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Cook. Mark. Welcome everybody to our webinar. Um, we'd like to acknowledge funding from not only NIDER, but also the Center for Mental Health Services of Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Start by covering the basics of directed care to make sure we're all on the same page about the kind of program that we're going to be describing today. In self-directed care, funds that are ordinarily paid to its provider are controlled by service recipients. Person-centered recovery plans create individual budgets that what dollar amounts they would like to spend in order to achieve their plan's goals. Staff support brokers are available to people with the purchase of services as well as material goods that have been budgeted in their plan. And find an organization called a fiscal intermediary for financial management services, but paying service providers and holding payroll taxes. The per plan helps people to identify who they are and how they'd like to live their lives. It includes people's future goals based on what kinds of lives they'd like to have. Sizes, ranks that people bring to the pursuit of their goals, and also includes the barriers they feel might exist to their goal attainment. The person center plan includes action steps and timelines needed to the individual's goals. The individual budget is directly connected to the person centered plan. It's structured that its line items relate directly to the goals the person is specified in their plan. In C, the program must be able to demonstrate a direct connection between achievement of goals, budgeted goods, and services, and that is designed to document this link. It is also monitored by the participant and broker on an ongoing basis. What word broker play in all of this? Well, broker does many things. First, help participants develop their person-centered plans and budgets and assist with navigating community resources, as well as managing the budget, requiring and negotiating rates with service providers, with billing through the fiscal intermediary. But the most important thing to remember about the broker is that they're always the co-pilot, never the pilot. The reason for being, activities in the program are designed to help the individual use the SDC program um, and help them use it in a way that furthers their recovery. You know, what kinds of organizations run mental health SDC programs? And the answer is that a variety of different types of organizations have been the home for these programs. Sometimes it's a mental health advocacy organization, such as Mental Health America of Southeastern Pennsylvania, or NAMI of Collier County in one of the Florida SDC programs. Regional Behavioral Health Authority, or a for profit service delivery agency. The care programs were run by peer for profit organizations. The ways in which, uh, or places in which, uh, an SDC program can be located in terms of its organizational home. The major difference in mental health SDC programs is whether they are replacements or add-ons. In SDC programs, people get all of their traditional outpatient 
patient services through their self-directed care budget. The case with Florida, Pennsylvania, and Texas. In other programs, SDU budgets are used for add-on recovery services, while regional traditional services remain intact. In that case for programs run in Maryland, Iowa, and Oregon. An important feature of SDC is that participants can choose service substitution. These restrictive goods and services that the participant chooses in order to achieve their recovery goal. They may decide to replace formal services with informal services. So using a mental health agency van to get somewhere, they pay an individual, a neighbor, or a colleague to drive them to a job interview. People can replace services with normal community activities. Instead of attending a weight management group at their mental health center, they simply enroll in Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig. Also include replacing public services with private ones. For example, if a person wants a clinical service that's not readily available in their community mental health center, many Texas SDC programs uh, use their funds to visit a psychiatrist that had expertise in treating trauma, for example, because that kind of psychiatrist was not available in the traditional system. And really, People use their SDC funds to replace services with goods. So the participant might replace using their peer center's computer with their own laptop purchased from their individual SDC budget. The thing about these service substitutions is that they're often actually cheaper than additional services that they're replacing. And that's part of what helps the SDC program an even important aspect called budget neutrality, which I'll refer to in a minute. If you're wondering where the need for mental health SDC programs come from, like all of our public mental health sellers in the United States today, um, tutor sources are used, Medicaid and state general revenue are tax dollars. Men have used state general revenue combined with Medicaid in, in some fashion. So some programs have added on funds to Medicaid services. So the Medicaid beneficiaries might receive additional monies through state taxes or through a grant funding additional services. Sometimes a total cash out model is used in which the Medicaid funds get pooled with other funds, such as state taxes, a grant that the government is able to win, patient funding, or key reinvestment dollars. Uh, this was the case with two programs, um, not all of those options, but different options were combined with Medicaid dollars by both the Texas SDC and the Pennsylvania SDC programs. The important goal here in SDC is that these programs be cost neutral. SD does not cost any more than traditional services, which is the reason um, that it is so popular with people on both sides of the aisle um, in both the political and the kind of theoretical realm of clinical services. What's evidence for health self-directed care? One of the published studies was done at the original Florida SDC program and looked at people's outcomes the year before and the year after they joined the program. Found that participants spent significantly more days in the community in the year after joining the program than they did in, let's say, jails or um, psychiatric in settings. Significantly higher on global functioning in the year after program entry. A portion of them were engaged in productive activities, such as working, receiving skills training, volunteering, or being enrolled in post-secondary education. People spent their money on both traditional and non-traditional services. This may sound like an odd finding, but some people argue that if they had control over their service delivery dollars, they wouldn't purchase traditional services. And this is simply not the case. See, we conducted a randomized control trial study of the Texas SDC program with Texas partners, where we compared the outcomes of people randomly assigned to the SDC program 
we will assign to the control condition and looked at those outcomes at baseline when they entered the study 12 and 24 months later. We found that the FDC participants had significantly lower somatic symptoms, having mastery, greater self-esteem, higher self-perceived recovery, to ask for help, and social support from other people, greater perception of their service delivery system as client-driven, had a greater likelihood of being employed than control clients. We found that the program was indeed budget neutral. Two years of the study, FDC participants had an average of $5,240 per person, while control participants had an average of $5,493 spent on them. The differences were even larger for inpatient costs, where the average per person was $295 for the SDC group and were twice as high for the um, control group. We found that SDC participants were highly satisfied with the program. They were satisfied with their brokers. They thought the mental health services that they were buying in the program were better than those that they were getting before SDC. And that even though there were some complaints about what they could and couldn't purchase, 90% felt that generally the rules for allowable purchases were fair. Turn now to the first manual that we'll be introducing in today's webinar, the one developed by my center entitled the Directed Care Implementation Manual, a Comprehensive Mental Health Program Guide. The IC manual is designed to showcase tips and tools from a number of successful FDC programs in order to help people implement their own FDC initiative from the ground up. You'll this manual if you'd like to learn how to mobilize your local community or state in order to embark on an FDC initiative. The manual describes how you might develop planning committees. FDC program model based on your area's strengths and needs, the that are available, and the organizations willing to come together to host and operate the program. And it describes how to staff and implement and run the program, the important roles of the program director and the support brokers. And the manual describes how to evaluate the program's impact on the lives of SDC participants. It contains nine chapters introducing the reason to the model of self-directed care and how it works, discussing how to get started on developing an SDC initiative, discussing the importance of being participant-driven, both in the way the planning is being, or excuse me, the program is being planned and the way it's designed, as how it's run and how the participants experience it. It's the SDC program structure, Taught the program director and support brokers what kinds of um, job qualities they need and providing job descriptions for these folks. How to design budgeting and purchasing procedures and policies that are fair yet keep the program budget neutral. It recovers eligibility, recruitment, and enrollment procedures. So think about designing those for your individual program. Chapter 8 is devoted exclusively to the key role of SDC support brokers, and 9 covers um, to evaluate the program to see that it's accomplishing positive outcomes for participants and how to maintain program fidelity. In the section of the manual, you'll find a number of helpful documents. You'll find the original state legislation that established the first two SDC programs for mental health in the country. Florida SDC programs. You'll see the job description I alluded to earlier. Um, forms and procedures for creating the SDC life plan, setting SMART goals. Um, uh, for the uh, Texas SDC program, stating participants' rates and allowable purchases. Um, a fidelity assessment that you can use to assess SDC. A research prevention plan that you might suggest that people use. A session survey that we used in our research at UIC. These are presented not for you to necessarily pick up and use exactly as they're presented, because in some cases we present 
forms that were used by multiple programs to give you a taste of how each program might have um, approached a particular program function differently. So they're trying to stimulate your thinking um, and to adapt and use for the initiative that you would like to make up. Using the manual is to first of all read in its entirety in order to understand the full dynamics of what you're trying to accomplish in an SDC initiative. This will ensure you're ready to address some pretty common concerns and fears and myths that people have with the facts and the figures that are put in the manual. You're going to want to use the manual in order to build a supportive SDC community, nurture your allies, and to be as inclusive as possible as you're playing your program. We've designed Chapter 1 so that each page can be torn out and used as a handout to share in the community um, or with the committees that you're working with. Regularly check your progress and your process against the SDC values that are described in Chapter 2. It's easy to drift away from some of these values and start limiting participants' choices um, or um, coming up with operational procedures that don't give people the flexibility that they might need in order to purchase the goods and materials that they really require in order to recover. To recover. You get to, to learn about various funding mechanisms that can support an SDC initiative in your community. You'll read about the very complicated um, CMS waivers that um, are available um, to fund MEP and other types of SDC. Even if you haven't yet seen one of these waivers used to describe any or to fund any of the comprehensive programs we describe in the manual, but they're there and someone's going to step forward and use it. I'm going to train and nurture a recovery oriented staff of brokers that embraces SDC values and principles, and also how to be ready for the inevitable ups and downs, the challenges, the times you want to tear your hair out, but also um, the times when you're really going to enjoy the ride. I'm going to be glad that you put all the effort into it. Um, inspiration is needed. You can turn to SDC testimonials. And once you read about how SDC has changed people's lives, how people have responsibly and effectively used their budgets, um, and how creative uh, and cost effective this approach is, um, I think it invigorates and, and helps to inspire you to deal with some of the more challenging moments of mounting an initiative. I'm going to end my segment by talking about ways you might tap uh, our center's expertise here at UIC. We're pleased to announce that we've just been funded um, by the federal government for a new center on self-directed recovery and integrated health care. And that center will offer a podcast and webinar about how to implement SCC programs and use this manual. And also available through our new center will be telephone technical assistance they can access. If you have more in-depth telephone and off-site consultation on designing a program, bringing people together to create an initiative, um, designing forms that are user-friendly yet make sure your program is protected and can show that it um, uses funds responsibly, um, UIC staff are available to come out and um, do consultation for safety. So two ways you can tap our expertise here at UIC. We'll learn about um, some others from uh, the Temple Center in a moment. Finally, I'd like to tell you how to access our manual, the one that I described today. And you do this, but you won't do it until tomorrow. Uh, starting October 2nd, you'll do this by visiting our website and click on our, the Planning a Self-Directed Care Program link that you can find in the News and Features section of the website. We'll go to our top page um, and set planning a self-directed care program, click it, and you'll be able to download the manual. Thanks for listening to um, information about our program, um, our research results, and the manual we designed. Now I'd like to turn it over to Ermi Mullet, Director of the Pennsylvania SDC program, to hear what they designed and have available. Hi, let me just get my PowerPoint up. Excited 
excited to be um, here with Judith and the UIC program to be able to talk about um, what we were able to develop in Pennsylvania. Um, a lot of that is due to our collaboration with what was going on in Texas. common definitions that we'll use or that we use in our program that we inherited the name the Consumer Recovery Investment Funds um, just talking about people need to invest in their own recovery. Um, SDC referring to self-directed care which is as Judith said referred to in a lot of different ways and we'll define the way that we utilize it within our program. Um, in Pennsylvania, we use certified peer specialists to be able to deliver the services of self-direction. Um, and the CPS at the Mental Health Association in southeastern Pennsylvania is referred to as a recovery coach. So our recovery coaches are trained both as certified peer specialists and RAP um, facilitators to be able to walk along with someone on their recovery journey to be able to self-direct it. And freedom funds are the funds that are used within this self-directed care budget to purchase non-traditional goods and services outside of the clinical realm. And so I'd like to really thank all of the partners that I've been able to work with and we've been able to work with throughout this project. Without them, we wouldn't be able to move forward. And it's really been an honor to bring together Mellon Behavioral Health Services. To be able to bring in Magellan Behavioral Health Services as a um, Medicaid care organization along with the Office of Behavioral Health in Delaware County, with the classes at Temple University um, and the Mental Health Association of Southeastern Pennsylvania to bring together both government and insurance and research um, all together with a service provider. It's really an experience that a lot of people have taken as a model to implement programs throughout the country. The philosophy is amending our program that we're based on the idea that recovery is possible. We're really talking specifically about mental health recovery. Although we incorporate people with a drug and alcohol diagnosis, that mental diagnosis this is the primary um, challenge that people come in with. I also believe in peer support and find peer support to the linchpin to help people move forward in their recovery um, and what they often have been missing with their clinical services. And the idea of self-direction. So self-directed care for us is on two different meanings. One is just the philosophy on how we deliver our services. Um, Peer support is a Medicaid billable service in Pennsylvania and needs to fall into the medical necessity and clinical guidelines that set, are set forth by the state, but we've really been able to incorporate those in a recovery-oriented way to be able to help people self-direct their own lives um, and their own recovery plans. But directed care also refers to the very specific SDC program of how people can manage their budgets. So similar to a lot of the other programs in a Texas program and looking at the idea of support bring without within person directed support services, um, people look at support bring as a way that people hire and manage their budgets. And we wanted to take that and incorporate it into what we use in Pennsylvania around certified peer specialists and peer support. So for us, recovery coaches really marry the two concepts of delivering peer support services who are trained to be able to help you broker those supports and budget within your self-directed care budget. And change the idea of person-centered planning, which we think is really important, but what we found was working with people who had been in the system a long time, that you just create these concentric circles of support around people, which made them not feel like they could actually move forward in their life and in their recovery. So changing that idea to be more that the person is at the front of that arrow and the, us as support are really behind them, moving them forward. And changing that dynamic really helps people understand that 
it's not just about staying stagnant where you are, but figuring out what you need in your life to be able to move forward in your life and what do those supports look like, whether they're financial or clinical. So a self-directed care process is, you know, really just a peer support process, is really focusing on these hopes and dreams, figuring out how to develop the skills and tools in all of the life domains that somebody has to figure out what sort of um, clinical supports do you need to be able to move forward toward those hopes and dreams, and then how do we expand the natural and community supports to do that? And then how do we figure out when we walk alongside study, how can we expand the resources they have to move forward in their life? Both that people identify really need to fit into the recovery plan that they develop along with their recovery coach. We recognize that recovery plans can change over time and that we, the recovery coaches can help educate participants about the concepts and processes of recovery. Our experience was that by entering into what started off as a randomized controlled study, sort of Texas, people introduced the peer support in the, for the first time and introduced to the idea of recovery and choice for the first time in a way that they had never in their life been introduced to. So really eye-opening for our coaches to be trained in a way to say, if you had no boundaries or barriers, um, your life look like, and for people who had been living with mental health challenges majority of their life to really get to think about that um, and, and knowing how to think about that and being supported around the feelings and um, you know everything that comes along with changes in your life. Another unique characteristic of our recovery coach, similar to support brokering, is the idea of being able to help the individual learn how to track their budget. Um, how to analyze actual utilization from the and claims data from the insurance company and incorporate that into their recovery plan. So in Pennsylvania, we have um, an MA billable service for peer support, which is one of the ways that we've helped sustain the program and deliver it um, within our context. It also helped us jobs for peers, but help enhance certified peer specialists in a way that really directs their peer support delivery service to be more self-directed. By giving people access to their claims data um, over a two-year period of time, as well as the time that they are within the project, allows them to see how not only how much services cost, but to be with, you know, recovery coach to ask the question of how does this service help me in my recovery, and if not, how do I evaluate it? How do I see if it's really the service that I find necessary for me? And is there another service outside of the system that might be better to meet these needs? Or how do I advocate for myself to get more satisfaction out of the service I provide? So it has really taken on a different um, angle of providing so that people can really be empowered in making decisions in their life. Similar to Texas, we delivered um, our free funds through an SDC card, which was, you know, a pay card that was delivered to each individual with their name on it. Um, and it didn't identify them as someone with a mental health challenge. We found that this really helped create responsibility of the funds. Um, people had to identify what the recovery plan is and what services or goods would be helpful in that plan. And that plan had to be approved on several different levels, including the managed care level. Um, and the individual res was responsible for only purchasing the items that were approved to help them move forward in their recovery. And they were able to do that at, by using this card in their name and keep the seeds. A lot of people felt really dignified to be able to make those purchases on their own and feel, you know, what they would say is normal. Ask, and we have hundreds of different examples, but, you know, depending on what their life goals were and what the real specific smart steps are um, to be able to reach the goals, these are some of the goods and services that fell into here. 
We also did access very clinical, specialized clinical services. So if we had, if we found a provider that was not um, an enlisted provider with our insurance company, they could use the funds to pay for a specialized um, provider um, to get services. But we found that people really looked for using uh, costs to cover transportation, education, really enhancing their um, literacy so that they could move toward getting jobs and be more incorporated into the community. We're really the places that people use Freedom Funds for. The project, um, a randomized controlled study, Temple you see, went out, and here are just some of the qualitative data that people had that they really, you know, felt good about be able to pick and choose what they really wanted and decide what they needed and what they didn't, that they, you know, want, they wanted to decide had wanted their treatment and be able to speak up about that. They didn't realize that they could refuse some of the services that they were receiving um, or just to enhance them in certain ways. So given opportunities, um, skills to be able to push back to different providers and say that, you know, where are these rules coming from? You know, can we talk about what the regulations are and can we we think about different ways to provide services and access services that would actually make me feel better in my own recovery. So it felt really good to be able to deliver this service and see the impacts it's had on people. We've seen that simple purchases um, have really made huge impacts in people's recovery, um, where some may not have ever left their home except to go to appointments, but something as simple as a bus pass or a digital camera gave them enough incentive to be able to leave their home and do something meaningful, which then led to them getting more training and socializing outside of the home. Um, people making better choices and more, uh, and asking more questions about the choices that they have in terms of socialization and trying out new things, but as well as accessing those clinical services. So the manual that we put together, um, or that Temple University put together, that we assisted in really takes everything that we did and put it into a manual with our forms and the process that we use to be able to create a self-directed peer support program and to provide a model of what some of that documentation would look like in, in a Medicaid um, service. If they pass it back to Mark. Let's see if we have to me. And you have any questions? And I just I just turned on my uh, video because they always seem so they seem so personal sometimes. So it's just a PowerPoint, so you get to see me in my office. So here I am. Uh, we have two questions. Uh, first, Nancy from Sweetland who is associated with the Florida SCC program that really has been up here in this area. It's uh, in particular to do this, how do you know if how do you know the barriers that SCC face have changed over time? What barrier do you see that we need to address as advocates? See, that's a great question. Um, and I think Nancy's motivated to ask that question because she's in a state that's had two of the longest-running SDC programs in the country. Um, I think that um, the early barriers are often um, the unfamiliar unfamiliarity of um, the local community and service providers and administrators and legislators with the model. Um, this that surround SDC, you know, people in recovery can't make good um, decisions about purchase and so forth and so on. Um, and I think probably people can guess about all of those early barriers. I think what's interesting is that the second generation program questions um, are related to people are going to be able to exit the program so that other individuals can get served. Um, so are there exit criteria? Uh, at what point do you um, judge together, the participant and the broker and the program director, that people's goals have been achieved? Um, so I think that is one of the um, second generation questions. And I think other second generation question has to do with 
now that we have pilot programs and they're successful, how do we now take things to scale and expand those pilot programs other community parts of the state? All right, Judith. And uh, for those of you sending in questions, keep them coming. The uh, question we have is how do participants in self-directed care find about resources outside of traditional services that uh, might be available to them? Uh, they also write, is there a database with is there a database complement or healing modalities or something similar to that that can you use? And one of the things that um, we found is that it takes a lot of training to get our recovery coaches or support brokers to be able to train them to think outside of the box, to figure out not only when, you know, how do you do um, circles, but how do you do issue-generated support circles, and how do you figure out who needs to be at the table to come up with different ideas. So some of it is really learning better ways of doing community integration and finding out what's in your community and learning how to do some door knocking um, to do that together. So part of peer support is not doing for you but doing with you. Um, so sometimes we do a lot of resource sharing. So if someone does find database around complementary healing, healing modalities, then we share that with other people. Um, but that's how we want to mirror how natural supports can be created. Just, this is just, I'd just like to um, uh, chime in. And uh, I also turned my uh, webcam on, so hi, everyone. Um, I think that support broker is key, and learning from each other, the program participants learning from each other, this helped me. This is a great massage therapist. I found a uh, trauma-oriented uh, clinician that's willing to come to my home. Those are some of the things that happened with Texas SDC. One of the things that Ermia didn't get a chance to talk about is that SDC programs have their own provider networks. And over time, um, they develop lists. We have one on the SDC website of alternative services like cooking classes and uh, personal trainers that will work with a group of people in order to reduce costs. Uh, herbal remedies, um, all of those things um, can be part of the provider network that the program assembles, and they do that in order to help participants make their budgets because for each provider there's a cost and what that provider offers. And then finally, I'd like to point out the purchasing policy that each program has lists the number of things that you can purchase and things that um, you're not able to purchase. And looking at those I stimulate participants to, to say stuff like, oh, wow, yes, that's right, I can join the line. Uh, or, oh, peer providers, of course, you know, I could hire somebody to drive me to my job interview um, rather than use a cab. So those are the kinds of things uh, that we're talking about in learning about alternative resources. Uh, Ermi and Judith, uh, uh, we have two questions on this. Uh, it has to do with what happens to remaining funds. Oh, actually, the same question repeated. Uh, what happens to remaining funds when clients, peers exit self directed care? We'll answer that in terms of how the Texas SDC program operated. Um, funds, people budgeted and spent quarter by quarter. And so funds that weren't spent in the first quarter rolled over into the second, and the third, and the fourth. But at the end of that time period, if people didn't spend their funds, um, they lost them and started over again with their new budget at the beginning of their next year of program participation. Um, and we did it this way because of accounting difficulties and also because some of the funding streams do require that monies be spent by the end of a fiscal year. Would you like to uh, add uh, what happens in Pennsylvania? Certainly, we had um, data that outlined the project. So, it didn't accrue or had access to Freedom Fund 
bonds one month and decided not to use them, we allowed them to roll those over until they were able, you know, or wanted to use them or had a reason to use them. But the funds, you know, will eventually run out at the end of a project period and then just won't have access to them after that until we move forward, hopefully, to a waiver or a different type of demonstration project in Pennsylvania. Great. Wonderful to see you. Uh, we have another question, actually, to Ermi and Judith. Uh, the person asks, can you speak about the differences between the two types of self-directed care presented? Self-directed care in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, and self-directed care in uh, Texas. It broke up when you asked that question. Could you ask it again? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, can you speak about the differences between the two types of SDC you presented? One of my first reactions from, from knowing both the, uh, both the types of SDC that, uh, that we're talking about is that there are actually numerous differences between the two different types of SDC. And in fact, and Judith and Ermi, uh, I know you've gotten to know programs around the country. Um, there are there are some differences. We could almost have a whole webinar, just differences between all the different SDC uh, programs. Are, are there a couple of differences that come to mind between what we've done in Texas? Sure. I, one of the differences between the two programs that I I think it's a dramatic difference is that in Texas, in order to set the size of the budget, which is around $4,000, we took the average that was being spent uh, for the, the services of people in the outpatient service delivery system in the area where we ran the pro program. Um, so this was an average across thousands of people, um, and that average turned out to be about $4,000. I think I'll hear me talk about how they determined what people had to spend. So each of our SDC budgets were based on each individual's historical claim data over a two-year period of time. Um, so the budgets were vastly different. And our big difference is that we require that our support broker recovery coaches be peers, where I believe Texas it was coincidental whether someone was a peer or not. And uh, you can see some of the manuals or certainly uh, contact us for more information about uh, uh, these programs. Another question that we have to do, uh, this one actually was directed to Ermi, how do recovery coaches, NDC, peer advisors is what the person wrote, how do they interact with the individual's managed care plan? So how, how do the program uh, interact with Magellan, in this case, in Delaware County, around uh, getting approvals for purchases or, or asks and those kinds of things? So there's several different points that we had interactions. Um, first is that the services delivered by the recovery coach are Medicaid billable service. So those that time is paid for through the managed care organization. Another way it was um, enacted is when you came up with your recovery plan, although that was kept in house, when you had, when the individual had a request for Freedom Fund utilization or works for Freedom Funds, they needed to, with the assistance of the coach, come up with a, um, fill out some paperwork to figure out how to show that it was medically necessary for their recovery to move forward, and that documentation got sent over to care managers at the MCO, which either approved it or didn't approve it and sent it back. So there's a lot of interaction just on a daily basis, and then both Magellan as well as um, MA both sat on the operations team, so they were part of the operations team to decide how do we uh, roll different parts of the program. Me. Um, I'm going to answer two questions that came in. One question was, why aren't people and other drug use, prior diagnoses without a co-occurring mental that's not included? Um, I can speak for what we've done in Delaware County. Uh, our primary focus was people 
with uh, mental health issues and um, uh, what qualifies serious mental illnesses in particular, schizophrenia spectrum disorder, bipolar disorder, and major depression, uh, we allow those individuals to have co-occurring issues as well. Uh, I could imagine there being a study at some point that looks at the, the um, impact of self-directed care with those with primary diagnosis, primary alcohol and, and drug uh, use diagnoses. Um, we just, both of these studies and projects focus on people with mental health issues. Some asked, are there any programs like this in the peer-run program that utilizes RAP facilitators and peer recovery coaches, but this is the first I've heard of SCC. Um, I actually uh, used to work in VMI myself, two tours of duty uh, in the VA system. My understanding is that VA has been talking about selected care to some extent. I'm not sure um, the veteran population they're trying or talking about rolling it out with. I don't know if this is part of the health home. Uh, issues that are happening in the VA. Understanding is that there has been a, uh, a discussion of self-directed care type models within the VA system. Uh, next question I have for you, Judith. Do you have any input on seniors in self-directed care? I'm referring to long-term participation in SEC, those unable to work. As an aging adult, being productive is valuable to recovery. STC offers the senior opportunities to continue making goals while to be productive in their communities. I think actually that STC is a fantastic model um, for seniors because the emphasis is really on productive activities and whether or not they're paid um, or unpaid, volunteer uh, versus the job is not what it's about, not what the emphasis is on. Um, I think it is a great model um, for uh, seniors, and I think there's a lot of interest in it. In the original um, uh, study that, uh, you know, SEC came out of Medicaid, and it was developed for people with um, a number of vulnerabilities, and one of them was for um, older citizens. And so um, in a study called the Cash and Counseling Study, one of the major groups that um, SDC and benefited from it were elderly individuals. Again, we actually got a little further clarification from, from uh, Nancy Sweet again with that question, but uh, unfortunately we're, we're coming close to the end, so we're going to have to um, maybe get back to you again later, Nancy. And I also uh, got clarification on, on what VA stands for. Uh, that person was actually asking for programs in Virginia, and there goes my, uh, you know, where my head is. I'm thinking they as Veterans Administration. So, uh, Jith or, or Ermi, do you know of any programs in Virginia? I do not uh, know of any programs in Virginia, uh, nor have I heard discussions about programs in Virginia. Discussions about very small social SDC program run out of Mental Health America with Patrick Hendry for people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, which looks very different than the two programs we're talking about, but is what a very small program in Alexandria. That's a great knowledge, uh, Army. So Mental Health America and Patrick. Uh, was involved with the Florida SEC, I believe, um, maybe helps get it launched. So I have a uh, near uh, Thank you for joining us. And again, remember that uh, we have these two manuals that provide great information about SEC from a policy standpoint and from an implementation standpoint. We will be releasing those manuals, uh, I believe, within the next couple of weeks. So everybody who signed up for this webinar will be getting an email uh, saying that the notes are available and can download them. As uh, Dr. Cook mentioned, we are all available to um, answer any additional questions that you might have regarding the implementation of self-directed care, uh, both the policy and the uh, service implementation issues uh, as well. So we're happy to hear from you. We're happy to help all of us are very committed to self-directed care. 
and then uh, it's revolutionary in how health services are delivered. I want to thank uh, my co-presenters, or really the primary presenters, Jen Army, for doing such a wonderful job and being such terrific partners and collaborators. Uh, and obviously, we also want to thank our partners, uh, AMSA and the National Institute of Disability Living and Rehabilitation Research really helped us do this cutting edge uh, research and cutting edge effort to get the information out there. So again, for joining us, uh, feel free to contact us with more questions or uh, criticisms or anything. We're happy to hear from you and have a great rest of your day.